I'm a dude, and I'm inviting you to join me on a podcast about brews. Does that include stouts? Yes. Yes, of course it includes stouts. Like I was saying, join us every Saturday on the journey hey, hey, into... Hey, co- wait a minute. Do you, do you guys do anything about, like, IPAs? Yes. Stuff like that? Yes, of, yes, of, yes, we do IPAs. Okay. okay. It's, it, yes. Anyway... Join us on the Journey into Comics Network for Brews with Dudes. Whoa, whoa, hey, hey, hey do you, have you guys ever, do you care if I bring some Zima on? Yes, I care if you bring Zima. Zima doesn't count. Zima, oh. Zima's, Dr. Dongo. Anyway, join us every Saturday for a podcast that delves into the craft brew world. The following, following. the following journey into comics. 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 Network. 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 Production. Production. Hey, hey, this is Josh Richmond, and you are listening to the Voice of Survival podcast, exclusively on the Journey into Comics Network. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of the Voice of Survival podcast. As the introduction said, I am your host, Nate, and today joining me, I have a very special guest. Super excited to have him on my show. Welcome to the Voice of Survival maestro, Kirk Muspratt. How's it going? Hey, Nate. I just finished conducting Flatermos. It was a wonderful experience. It actually was. I was on the other side of that experience. Uh-huh. I only kind of saw like the hair a little bit from the, from the pit. You know, mm-hmm. it was really excellent. It was my first operetta, mm-hmm. and overall, I thought the experience was spectacular. Did you laugh a few times? Several times. It was Good. very funny. There were mm-hmm. some interesting, seemingly improv moments that might have happened at this yes. performance that were really yeah. well sprinkled in there. Uh-huh. So, uh, nice verb. you know, I, I look at the bigger picture of you. I've seen you conduct the Northwest Indiana Symphony. I've seen you do this now with the Pitt Orchestra and, and running the uh, McCainich, is that right? McCainich. McCainich. We just uh, call it the Mac. The Mac. Okay, yeah. so you run the Mac's music uh, department, essentially. No. The direction. No. No? No. Really? No. I conduct the New Philharmonic Orchestra okay. and the opera here, which actually has nothing to do actually with the college. Oh, that's so interesting. So I don't have anything to do with the students here. The vision of the Mackinich when it was built was that they would have professional groups here in residence. Oh. So New Philharmonic is it's actually a separate organization. We certainly use the facilities. We have staff here that help us enormously, and we're like a partner, but we're, we don't actually do any teaching. It's, it's a resource for the community. I think that's the best way to say it, is that you can live in Downers Grove or Glen Allen or you know any place near Geneva, whatever, and you can drive here in a few minutes, park for free, get a ticket that's reasonable, not have to drive downtown for 18 hours, park for $6,000, etc., and I, just I, be are... here in a beautiful hall, a beautiful intimate hall with a really fine product. Absolutely. Uh, I love that you said, like, it's so expensive to park in Chicago. That's funny. Uh, so I've seen you do all the, all the like, kind of like your, your bigger things, obviously. You're a conductor. It's your passion. But in order to understand you, I think we need to go to the start of the journey, work our way up to where we are now. So where are you from? I mean, I know the answer, but my audience obviously does not. So I'll let you answer. I was born in heaven. I was born in a place called the Crow's Nest Pass in Alberta. It's one of the three passes in the Rocky Mountains. It's the one that isn't commercialized like Jasper or Banff, like the one. It's a very small coal mining place. Uh, when I was a little boy, there were seven coal mines working there. Um, uh, it has a mountain that I grew up on the side of called Turtle Mountain that fell one night in 1903 and demolished the entire town of Frank. There's, uh, it's like three miles this way by three miles that way of nothing but limestone and, oh, I don't know, 400 feet deep. 
you know, it's that kind of place. Um, everybody knows each other. Um, on the other side of Turtle Mountain, a few years later in 1914, there were 600 people living in the village of Hillcrest because there's just these little tiny villages that are like all cemented together around the mountains. And in the village of Hillcrest in this morning in June, there were um, 600 people living in the village and I think 168 men were killed in 15 seconds in a mine blast. Whoa. So they say that every woman in the village lost either their father, their brother, their husband, or their son, and some people lost more than that. So there were women from Czechoslovakia, Poland, Russia, Belgium, off the boat, 26 years old, with two kids, had no income, no skills, no nothing, and now their dad is dead and their husband's dead. And it's that kind of place. I'm telling you, it's an amazing place. Um, it's an amazing Rising place. from the ashes. Yeah. Exa oh, that's one of the things they say about the Frank Slide. But I'm just saying that because everybody, I grew up in heaven because I grew up in a place that was remote from everywhere. There was snow, hockey, music, and people being very close. Everybody went to a dance on Friday night. Uh, everybody, every kid, like every parent I knew except my boring parents who are like English kind of, they spoke another language at home. So, you know, my friend, uh, Lauren Giacomuzzi, his parents spoke Italian at home. Charlie Husick's parents spoke Czech at home. You know, it didn't matter. And they had Czech food or they had Polish food or they had Italian food and they had Verdi plain and they were making sausages and they were making dandelion wine. And of course, I didn't know anything. I just thought that's what everybody did. But, you know, if you go to Calgary now where my brothers live, it's like everybody has five TVs and 12 iPods and, you know, it's like... You know, but I grew up in a time when all those people from Poland and Belgium and from Germany loved music. They appreciated music, and it was very normal for a little kid like me, after my first day in grade one, my mother to pick me up and take me for my piano lesson. And every kid I knew had piano lessons. Every kid. And we have the second oldest orchestra in all of Canada in the Crow's Nest Pass, believe it or not. The Montreal Symphony is the oldest symphony. The Crow's Nest Pass Symphony is the second oldest. And I think the Toronto Symphony is the third oldest. So in fifth grade, they come to school and they say, do you want to play another instrument? Because you played the piano now for five years, all of you. And then you go to band on Thursday night after hockey practice. And there's one adult and then a child. And one adult and a child. And one adult and a child. I have no idea how I learned to play the trombone. I have no <laughs> idea. I was there in my sweaty hockey outfit. And then on Wednesday, the next year, they let you go to play an orchestra, which is on Wednesday night. And the reason you go to orchestra on Wednesday night is, first of all, all the ladies bake and they bring great food. And there are also really pretty girls in orchestra, you know, and they play the violin and viola and stuff like that. So, you know, I had hockey and cold and a good education and beauty are all around me and there are bears coming down off the mountain and there's moose in your backyard and heaven that's a really long-winded answer but if i'd grown up anywhere else i wouldn't be a conductor now okay i feel like you grew up in genuinely a melting pot uh -huh. everybody different um styles of living and different cultures just blending and having to have community not necessarily just because they were in the same place but the culture around there had suffered tragedies consistently that had blended everybody together. Absolutely. And uh, I feel like uh, it inspires people. Music is a great um, soother of, of emotions and, and, and fi uh, finding a good way to get your emotions out. So I feel like it only makes sense that you would play piano. Uh, was the trombone a little bit more of like a you had to do it because you kind of got put in a situation? Or were you just like, sure, let's pick it up and go? No. Uh, first of all, when I grew up in Canada... If you didn't do what your parents told you, my dad would take a stick to me in the backyard. My grandpa would take a stick to me in the backyard. He'd just look at you and you go like, okay, I'll mow the lawn. It wasn't like, well, do I get paid or, you know. No, no, it was like you absolutely, there was a lot of respect for people and the grandparents and things like that. You just did what you were told. My parents weren't, you know, mean or anything like that. Actually, the reason I played the trombone is I'm a complete screw up. 
I had, the Calgary Symphony had come down to play in the high school one day, and I, I don't know, but I was very attracted to music, and I heard this guy playing a trumpet when I was in school. So I said, can I go to the bathroom, please, you know? And I walked out, and Harry Pynchon, who was the principal trumpet of the Calgary Symphony, was warming up in the gym on this silver trumpet, Ooh. and I just got goosebumps. Just like, wow. So they came the next year and they asked me, like, what instrument do you want to play? And I said the trombone because I thought this was a trombone. And then, like, a month later or something, the mayor and the fire chief and the police chief and the teacher came to our house and they opened this instrument on our front room and they said, here's your trombone. And I go, that's not a trombone. And they go, yes, that's a trombone. And I go, no, no. No, that's not a trombone. So that's how I got with the trombone, you know. But it was a good instrument. It's lots of fun. It's actually easy to play, and it gives you lots of time to look at the older girls in the orchestra. You know, it's not like playing flute or something. So with, uh, let me let me ask a sub-question to the symphony here, because mm -hmm. that just opened up a lot of things. Two things you said that stuck out when you were saying you first got into symphony and why you liked going. Baking and girls. Oh, Yeah. I don't think it really surprises me that you're a conductor because it still seems like there's nice baked goods after your events, and there are pretty ladies roaming about and, and, and doing amazing things for you guys. Okay, Nate, you realize we're living in 2019, right? Yes. You, I, you, uh, I'm oblivious to any people who are called girls. <laughs> there is no such thing as a girl. I, I'm an androgynous human being, and whoever is playing... That's nice as long as you play the right notes. I don't care if you're singing. I don't care. I mean, if you're a lady, you should sing a lady's part, I suppose. But, no, I have no awareness of girls whatsoever anymore, and I want to say that on air, okay? I never get a cookie, you know, because, you know, obviously you people consume them like maniacs. Um, no, it's really funny. I tell people, because I try to do this for kids in my own little way. I try to reward them. I try to remember what it was like to be 7 or 9 or 11. I didn't like Bach when I was 9 years old or Mozart when I was 12 years old. What I liked was they have a music festival in Canada in every single little town in the springtime. And you go and you play when you're in first grade, you play a little cowboy. And you get your suit and you get to skip school and you go and there's 30 little kids that are seven years old or six years old and you each get up and play the little cowboy and then the adjudicator from the University of Manitoba tells you play more staccato that was very good and I used to win all the time so I'm like like any kid like oh I'm getting a trophy I won five dollars my first year I won a five dollar check from the a check from the Lions Club and there was all this baking. There was Rice Krispies and fudge bars and stuff. And my mother would give instructions to the, her friends. Do not let them have anything if they have anything on their plate. They must finish. Oh, and they had pop. My mother would not allow us to have pop. So my brother and I would, like, get a pop, and then we'd stash it out in the snow. Then we'd go get another one, and we'd stash it in the snow. And these horrible things, like my mother one year in the springtime, she screamed my name. She went, Kirk, Edward, Mossbrat. And I go, oh, no, what did I do now? And I guess at one point at the end of the little concert season, I had taken a bunch of fudge and brownies and put them in my pockets of my little sports coat. And then I had hung it up in the closet and it had stayed there all summer. No, I guess it was, in the, it was in the fall when it was time to go do stuff again. And there was this green stuff growing out of everything, and it was like just a wreck. So why did I go and do this stuff? Because I was good at it. I got attention. I got to skip school. I got to eat. You know, and I got trophies. You know, now all I'm like, is that note staccato? Did you play that accent? Why did you do that sforzando on the G string? You know? It's a completely different motivation. You know, plus I'm a boy, so I'm dumb. You know what I mean? Ugh. I don't know. It's not a very good story. Maybe I shouldn't have told that. That was a great story. I loved it. Uh, I do have a sub-question there now that you just guided me to the next one. You talk about conducting, and I think it's very important to note that you started as a piano player, moved to trombone. We're going to talk about more instruments that probably get picked up in the middle 
there mm-hmm. somewhere along the path. You probably picked up a couple more, I would guess. Just rock and roll stuff. Okay. Okay. We're into that. We'll talk about that in a second. But I want to know, this is a question that's been eating at me. What, did it, what did, is it like for you to essentially play people? You have to listen to an entire group of at least 100 people as yeah. one body of sound. And if one oboe is a fraction of a note off, it's chaos for you. And you hear it immediately and you have to point it out and go, no, that's not right. We have to fix that. But what is that experience like to, I mean, in some ways it's going to sound weird to say, but you almost play God to these people. Well, you know, Sarah's sitting here in our audience. She was there taking notes for me in the rehearsal that night. So she will tell you that I said oboe, wrong note in bar 288, or, you know, you're behind in the pizzicati in blah, 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 or bass drum, you're a little bit too loud in blah, blah, blah. So the whole secret, Nate, is number one, you have to have very good training. You have to be a good musician. Then you need experience. You need to be a fool for a long time on the podium. You need to really learn great baton technique. And then you cannot do it all at once. It takes years and a lot of time. We call it on the box. You have to just spend time on the box. Learning how to listen to all of that. Because as you know, Nate, what you're doing is you're conducting ahead of the orchestra at least one beat. You're also thinking about three bars ahead of what's happening. Otherwise, you can't just go uh, like that to them. And, you know, like maybe say I use the bass drum, for example. The bass drum hasn't played in seven minutes and if you studied your score you know that there's a bass drum entrance so if you just turn your head two bars before and you look at andy or whoever's playing bass drum and he's sitting there counting bars for six minutes and you just look at him and you give him a little breath or a wink or something like that then he goes "Ah, i'm in the right place and the guy studied his score so you have to know all of the score very very well you have to have studied all the parts and it is an incredibly time-consuming thing. I often try to use the analogy, if you're Scorsese or, you know, and you're having to do a great movie, I don't care, pick so, or the somebody. The Departed. Yeah, sure. yeah, The Departed. Or let's say you're going to, you have the screenplay for Sophie's Choice. How do you, you know, how do you put that together in your head? How well do you know their words and where you're going to put them on the staircase and what the lighting's going to be and what Streep's going to wear and why Kevin Klein's going to be doing this and what time of day, all of that. You have to know it inside out so that if something goes haywire, you can fix it right away. And that score that we just did today, I have about it's about 465 pages long. So if you don't study the oboe line all the way through it and know it and you don't study the flute line, all the way through it, and then see how they mix and what the problems are and where you're going to have to rehearse. It's an incredibly complex thing, and again, it takes training and experience. And just, uh, uh, can I say bad words on your cast? 100%. So I call it ass time. Okay. You have to sit by yourself. And get lost in it? You have No, you have to sit there and be the most boring person in the world and just go, I'm going to study the oboe part in number eight. And then you want to kill yourself, you know, you know, I also call it study prison. You know, I call it Kirkatraz. Okay, you know, I love like, that. It's Kirkatraz, you know, and I try to tell Ben, you know, our associate conductor, I say, Ben, you just have to go and sit down by yourself and get lonely. You know, you have to spend, it's like being a really good stage director. If you're going to do Tom Hanks in Castaway, how do you plan that thing that takes three years and for him to lose all that weight and for him to have all those different looks and, and you know, do all of that with one person on an island and make it work and kill us all, you know, with the beauty of the, how do you, how do you do that as a stage director or as a director of a film? So it's, it's like that. And of course it's gorgeous because in the end, how many people in Chicago conducted an opera today? You? Two, three, maybe, maybe in the whole city. Okay. So like anything in life, you say, what's this worth? I have a child. What do I have to do for him or her today? You know, I have a family. What did I have to do today? You have a score. All these talented, smart people. Anne's in the room with us right now. Okay. So Anne is doing PR and she has that component of what we do. And she trusts that she can sell it to people and be honest about it and say, if you come, you'll have a great time. So in the end, if I don't do my job, 
It's a disaster. It really is. If I conduct well and I'm on, they play well. Nah. Or can I say it a different way? If I don't conduct well, they play pretty, you know, much 20%, 15%. They can't. You know, it's just they've got a rotten guy up there in front of them. And singing-wise, too. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing process, actually. It's kind of magical. I have to say, you think of a tempo in your head, you take a breath, you know what the words are coming up, you know what the problem Adele has with that high G, you need to give her a little more time, you start and you have 40 people play exactly the same tempo with you. And it's not pop, 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 and it's not pop, 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 it's pop, 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 and you just move your hand once. And if you do it right and you know what you want, they're really good musicians. They'll do it. I don't understand it, actually. Sometimes I'm like, how'd that happen? <laughs> it's like magic in your yeah. own magic. Yeah. I, I think of it, I'm not being just a nice guy. I think of it much more of a responsibility. But to your question, it is manipulating people in a good way. Again, like a good stage director. How do you deal with uh, Meryl Streep? in Bridges of Madison County. Do you do first take stuff with her because she loves first takes? Or mm, do you say, no, let's do it again? And is she going to rebel after a while and do a worse job the fifth time around because she's given it all? So, you know, the, the, you know, I can give you examples in the last few days, you know. There are things that went haywire, and I let them go. Okay. You know, you just let it go. Don't sweat the there's small other, stuff. Yeah, but there's times when all the small stuff adds up to no art anymore because it's all detail. And there's some times when you just have to bark and or just not be happy with your eyes or, you know, the way you finish a piece, the way you walk out to the podium, you know, all of it. And that's not being a jerk or something. It's, you know, if you're going to do death and transfiguration, why would you walk out in a certain way? If you're going to do a fun Stars and Stripes Forever, why would you walk out like Darth Vader? You know, what kind of face do you have? How do you, where are your feet? Where are your legs? How do you approach the orchestra? What's your posture? Where's your, where, you know, how do you hold your head? And it has to come after a while naturally to you. Awesome. Uh, so now with that, I'm going to ask a, another little subset from the actually you know, conducting everybody mm -hmm. because I feel like you are a rare breed because not everybody, not everybody on earth, let's just be real, can conduct people like you have and get not just um, a great career out of it, but you've had recognition for doing this. I mean, just as recently as 2018, I believe you won the um, the conductor award from the Illinois, um, what is that called? The Council, uh, of, yeah, Orchestras. Council of Orchestras. Yeah, it's very nice. It's uh, very humbling and I deserve it. No, I'm just kidding. No. Um, but, I mean, I feel like you put a lot of work in to just get to that, and I don't think everybody... Yeah, I didn't even know I'm up for it, so it's oh, something wow. nice that happens, and that's great, and um, it's wonderful. You know, I mean, in the end, you want it because you can use it in promotional materials and market materials. Somebody from the outside has said, you know, this guy's doing well or his orchestra's doing well. You can also go to a donor at some point and say you know, we're doing a good job. I mean, would you invest in us? Would you invest in my musicians? Would you invest in our singers? Would you help us pay for the set? Would you help us with a new, we need a really beautiful costume next year for blah, blah, blah. And, you know, a person can take that, you know, come on, you know, once you win the Academy Award, you've won the Academy Award and they never just call you Nate anymore. They call you Nate, okay. winner of the Academy Award for blah, blah, blah. And we live with those titles. It's ridiculous, but it's human. And um, so it's very nice. It's it's very nice. Um, it's very nice. Um, and thank you for mentioning it. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we're going to go back into your youth a little bit more. Did growing up in Crow's Nest Pass with that wilderness around you mm. and living in a world where it's a lot different than m metropolitan Chicago, did that give you different kinds of... I guess the word would be appreciation for your surroundings now in your life because you had almost a more secluded experience growing up. You should hear me when I'm driving on the freeway. Like Ben was on the phone with me today and I said some really bad words, 
really bad words about stupid traffic and stupid Chicago. You know, I, I told, I said to uh, somebody the other day, I, I was home a few months ago. I came into Calgary around midnight and I got my car and I was driving down to the Crozenus Pass. And I actually, after a while, I started to have an out, outer, out of body experience, which I never have, because I didn't see a car for about 25 minutes. And I was like, did the bomb hit? Did Canada go to war with somebody? You know, because there's got to be a truck somewhere. What I didn't know, there was a storm down the road a little bit, a big storm. And, I, you know, but it was like so nice to be on a normal road, you know. And, yeah, it's so nice to just go home. I, I'm going home on Tuesday. And it's so nice, you know, you wake up and there's three deer in your backyard. And there's people walking by and they say hi. Or if you really wanted to, you can still, you know, just knock on somebody's door and borrow a cup of sugar and leave them a note. You know, and I, you know, this is not a Hillary thing. I believe everybody should grow up in a village because you have the influences of, like, I had the influences of every man in that village. So this man had a great sense of humor. This guy was a great father. This guy was a hard worker. This guy was, um, you know, very romantic. This guy, you know, blah, blah, blah. He was a, you know, good coach. And so let's say your dad drinks. He doesn't, but great example. Sure. Let's say my dad drank. Okay. You know, and maybe my parents didn't have such a good relationship. Okay. But all the men around me that I knew by name, I knew their dog's name. I knew their cat's name. I knew all their kids' name. I had all those people sort of touching me every day. Every woman, every grandmother, every grandfather, all those people are in me somewhere. And I feel like a repository of them. And I know how to say it. I feel very attached. Good. That's awesome, man. It's uh, yeah. it's amazing and, to yeah. get the experience of having a support system that's bigger than just mm-hmm. your family. That's, it's not everybody gets that. Sub-question in all of this. I, you mentioned you had brothers, right? You had two brothers that live in Ontario, is the no, guess? No, in Calgary. In Calgary? Uh, are those your only two siblings? Yeah. Okay, older? One older, one younger. Oh, so you're the middleman. Yeah, I'm Kirk. You know, okay, it doesn't I'll... matter about them. They're okay. like my weenie brothers. Great, I love that. No, I'm kidding. They're fine people. One's a, one's a lumberjack. And one's a captain on the fire department in Calgary. Man, you guys have all different, very incredible paths, it seems. Like, those are all different. They're both very musical guys. They played, you know, very well. Like, my little brother, who's a fire captain, he played the violin, went to violin camp, all that stuff. But, you know, the paths that each person takes is astonishing. I mean, I shouldn't be conducting an orchestra in Chicago. I'm from a coal mining village in Alberta. The likelihood of you getting out of Alberta to makes do no something sense. bigger than this it makes no sense. It is difficult, but you pushed through. So you picked up trombone. You said there was some rock and roll stuff. Oh. So did you get, I'm guessing, not only just exposure to that kind of music, but you kind of fell in love with that music? Is that oh, the. Oh, yeah. Okay. I started my first rock band in fifth grade. So we took cardboard boxes from the hardware store. And old hockey sticks that we'd broken, and we made cardboard pretend guitars, and we painted them with all our model paint. I remember I took all my brother's model paint, and like that was all gone. And then we just put record players inside the fake drum things from the hardware store because we just made them, you know. And then we charged a dime for our concerts in the garage. And we were, we were just lip lip syncing, of course. I had I we had Beatles, we had Stones, we had like, and I had to be Jagger, and I had to be Lennon. You know, I wore glasses, so I had to be Lennon. You know, I mean, you know, so, no, no, I loved the rock music, and I, you know, and then I, you know, I got an organ at some point. My parents, like, I don't know how they ever afforded it, so I was the keyboard dude, Ooh. and I sang. Ugh, I really sang. You know, and I had long hair down to my butt and all this kind of stuff. And I loved it. And I was with older guys all the time. Like when I was, because I knew music, I could say, oh, yeah, pick a song, pick a song. Okay, what's your favorite Rolling Stone song, Veronica? Okay, you have a Stone song, Sarah? Paint it black. Paint it black. Okay, that's got an unusual harmony to it. 
not very many chords. <laughs> you know, I see a red door and I want to paint it black. Boop, 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 boop. You know, it's got, I mean, it's ascending, which is unusual. Yeah. So I could figure it out for the guys. These guys who are 20, 19 are playing, you know, they're working in the mine and they got a fender and they got, a, you know, a Stratocaster and they've got a set of pearl drums and they'd say, okay, uh, Kirk, figure out the chords for us. And I tell them, oh, yeah, it's C, E flat, F minor, you know, whatever. And then we play it and we try to get the right sound a little bit, you know. But I'm 13 and I'm with these 20 year old guys who are working in the mine with Dodge Chargers and Mustangs and beer and stuff you know so i loved it oh and the places when i walk in the crows this past night i go we used to rehearse in there we used to rehearse in your basement we used to rehearse there remember when we were there oh that place it got ripped down we used to rehearse in there so yeah it was a big part of my you know and i got in a lots of trouble doing that like lots of trouble so you became a rebel you can you go ahead yeah. and have a drink take a second uh so you become I'm not a drinking i'm drinking soda not a drink thank you for clarifying uh <laughs> But uh, it seems like you had an evolution of yourself through exposure to everything in Crow's Nest Paths. It, it's, it's almost as if you encompass the spirit of that place. And you've brought that spirit away from Crow's Nest Paths, obviously, and kind of planted a seed here and said, this is oh. the culture I want to grow, is unity, everybody working together, uh, always driving towards a bigger goal, but always learning and evolving from each other. And I think that is one thing I noticed just – it is so easy to notice it just rubs off on people from you. Thank you. I try to keep the crow's nest pass in me. I try to tell people you cannot take the crow's nest pass out of me. And it is still the dirt in my blood. And uh, I will die there someday and I will be buried there. And uh, I want everybody to travel there tomorrow and see what it's like, even though it's a little cold there right now. It's such a wonderful, beautiful, heavenly place. I, you know, I, if I'd grown up in Banff, which is the next pass up by Calgary, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be a musician now because Banff is completely commercialized. It's like, oh, go to the Banff Springs Hotel. Oh, go to the gondola. Oh, buy the plastic Mountie. Oh, get yourself a beaver hat. Oh, you know, go up to the, you know, whatever. It's all super go touristy. Go skiing, go skiing, go skiing. Oh, you know, like go buy an apple for 20 bucks. You know, it's like. So, yeah, and I try to do it with kids. You know, I want kids to feel comfortable. I want the audience to feel comfortable. I want them to feel connected to the musicians. I want them to feel connected to me. We're all absolutely, it doesn't matter whether you're a maestro dude or you're an oboist or you're a first-timer or you're a first-timer like you are today. Yeah. Everybody's equal. Everybody's welcome. It's beautiful music. It's, you know, it's an equalizer for all of us, and we all need each other. I need you to come to the opera and love it and come back. Otherwise, there's no use me slashing away down there in the pit with my baton. You know, I, I need you. It's like the, there's no one to listen. What's the point of the opera? It's the tree falling in the forest. Yes. Yep. Uh, so you talked about kids and the importance of mm -hmm. them being brought kids. into this in a positive manner. Mm -hmm. I think that's huge because kids getting uh, brought into music at an early age and seeing the good uh, in music, right? It led you down a good path, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's your experience. You go, okay. So let's talk about this real quick. Not everybody knows this, but you have like a bag of goodies sometimes for kids. <laughs> My like, magic orange bag yeah, of presents. Yeah, I like it. It's uh, Was that something like you one day thought, oh, that's smart. Like here's a little extra incentive to a kid when they're coming to the opera or to the symphony? Oh, or Good question. I'm not sure it evolved. I wanted, I noticed like, like, you know, for instance, a little girl named Esther came today. And I know her mom and dad, her dad works on the stage crew. And she came last year to the opera and she'd asked her mom, I found out, mommy, can you get my opera glasses out for me? Because I heard, you know, daddy's working at the opera. Can we go? She's seven. So I did some like spy work. I found out what her favorite color, her favorite animal was. Da, 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 da. I asked her mom what kind of stuff she'd like, you know. And I said, well, tell her I want to, I'm looking forward to seeing her again. So I want that little smart sensitive girl to go oh that man whoever he is the guy with the suit on to he remembers me she's in second grade i mean her her understanding of you know all of this is a second grader but if i point her out and i make it personal to her then i think the experience is a little more positive for her plus when the kids are a little bit smaller 
I noticed that I'd go to say hello to them when they're three or four after summer concerts. There'd be little kids that come, and then they get all shy, which is very natural, and they hide behind their dad or their mom. So I just, at some point, I had some stuff on me. I'm not sure what I had, or I had something in my briefcase. I had some extra glow pens or something. And maybe 15 years ago, I said, you know what, I have something in my bag for a little girl who's four years old. And is it okay with your mom if I just give this to your mommy for you? And all of a sudden, the kid comes out, and they're fine, and they're smiling, and everything's cool. And you break the ice, and then you just say, are you six years old? Well, you know they're four, you know. And they go, no, I'm four, you know. And then you start talking to them for just a few seconds, and then you're, they're okay, you know. And, of course, there are kids now that say, I remember coming when I was in kindergarten, and now I go to, you know, I you or something like that, you know. Yeah, I mean, kids are really important to me. I love kids. And if I had my druthers, and I know Ann, our PR agent, does not want to hear this, if I could do something, I would be playing concerts for kids every day, even though we go broke. <laughs> Just because it would give them such a uh, positive push in this world, I think. Yeah, if you, I mean, you know, you do a concert for kids, you can play Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, Von Supe, Puccini for them. If you present it to them, you understand how old they are. Like if they're six, you present it to them in a certain way with certain lengths at a certain time of day. If they're 13, you can do the same concert almost and present it in a different way. If they're 18, you present it to them in a different way and focus on different things in the music. But music is a God-given miracle. I mean, it's a gift to all of us. And people will love beautiful music. I mean, people will love beautiful music. You just came to an operetta today. You'd never been to an opera. The piece is 145 years old, and you enjoyed it. It was amazing. Because it's a piece of genius. Yes. So any little kid, whether it's like, oh, I'm five and I like Dairy Queen, that's really natural, you know? And, oh, I'm five and I don't like cabbage. That's kind of natural. natural. If you play music for them when they're five years old, they'll go crazy over Beethoven as long as you just describe it correctly to them and you pick it right. And it, it's one of, it, again, I use the word miracle. It's just a miracle. They will react to it. They will react to it. And then they'll find their own music when they're 14 or 12. They'll find their own, you know, pop, rock, you know, they don't want to listen to what their older sisters who are in college listen to. Not necessarily. No, Lady Gaga, blah. You know, what, you know, you know I love Lady Gaga, by the way. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you're, older, if you're 12 and your older sister's 20, you don't want to listen to her music. She's an old, boring doofus. So you'll find out. But you will listen to Tchaikovsky and be blown away by it. So, and kids are, you know, kids are, I don't know, what's better, music or kids? Uh, music or kids, uh, music or kids, <laughs> music or kids. You know, it kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah, I mean, music really, or kids. What's uh, what's better? Because the music, music can enable joy in a certain way because it's meant to do that, and it's supposed to actually give you different emotions. Music is never supposed to just give you nothing, right? You shouldn't listen to a piece of music and be like, "Oh, that was great." It did nothing for me. Oh no! You should have a reaction, even if you hate it. Absolutely, right? So uh, from that. Uh, I just got thrown off track. I had a question no, for no, you. No. And I totally lost it. Uh, sorry, I was doing. No, stuff no, it's not you. Feel. It's it's not you. This happens to me all the time. They can attest. Sometimes the brain just spaces the question when it's right in front of my face. It's okay. So I have a, I have a sub question though. Have you had a moment where let's say it's been a humbling experience for you? You mentioned that you had, you know, oh, I was in kindergarten, so and so, and now I'm in IU. Have you had a situation where someone's been in kindergarten or little when you first met them in their life, and now they're playing music for you or have uh, auditioned for you even. Yeah, I mean, you happen to live in Indiana, so I can give you an example that I'm very happy about. Um, uh, just an example. Mm, 14, 15 years ago, there was this little girl. She was scrawny, like maybe nine years old. She probably weighed five pounds. She came in and she played the violin. And she played really well. Like, you just go, that kid's a natural on the violin. She's got a beautiful bow arm. She's really in tune. She's got a lovely sound, even though she's playing on a quarter-sized violin. And she won. She was one of the winners of the competition, you know, that I have. So a little child can, or a big child can come and play, you know, for two minutes in, at intermission 
at the concerts and it's just a recognition and encouragement thing so she was so good that i went to her mom and her teacher and i said you know what she's going to be 10 next year i think she's such a natural and she had had piano lessons she could read music well i think she could be in the youth orchestra and i went to the youth orchestra director at the time and he goes she's only 10 because usually the kids are 14 15 16 17 she's 10 so she auditioned and she got in and she played in the last chair of the second violins and i'm telling you her legs were like like i remember she was like this big she probably you could just blow on her she didn't fall over and her feet i remember her she was so short that her feet did touch the ground she had to lean forward she played so she worked her way all the way through the youth orchestra and became the co concert master and the cool thing was that her mom said that she wasn't really sure about the violin, the little girl. She was sort of, mm, and I said, oh, all the better. If she's with these older kids, she'll become the favorite. They'll all adopt her. They'll all, you know, she'll become like, you know. She's going to learn all the techniques too yeah, from and them. And she'll watch and she'll be turned on by the older kids and it'll be a social experience for her. So um, last year, she got a job in the Dallas Symphony. Whoa. And it's a very good orchestra and the competition for that seat in the Dallas Symphony is enormous so Man. maybe me saying something to somebody about blah blah yeah it works it actually works absolutely it works you know not, I don't care whether a kid becomes a musician or not but if they have the chance to play music and enjoy friends and be with nice people and the parents get to be with other nice people and it's something they remember I can tell you for all of us in the room that play that you did in ninth grade, that's the thing you remember about ninth grade. You do not remember your chemistry class. That trip you took with the youth orchestra to Salzburg, that's what you remember about your grade 11, you know, your summer. That band camp you went to at Blue Lake, that's what you remember. You don't remember the basketball game unless you were the star of the basketball game or something. You weren't the star of the basketball team, right? Oh, no, I was pretty good at basketball. Really? Even though I'm not exactly what you call tall, um, no, I was a pretty good guard, and I lived right across the street from the school. So my my mom was a teacher in that school. So you know, my mother wanted to keep an eye on us. So we would go over to the school when she's doing making, you know, and we'd get basketballs out, and I would throw hoops. And I was a pretty good three point shooter, you know, for a guy that's like four foot three or something, you know. I'm, you were young Steve Nash before Steve Nash. Yes, and I still like playing basketball. And when I go home to the Crow's Nest Pass in the summer, there's like a court out there in the middle of the grass, and I go shoot some hoops. Excellent. So you're not any good at dunking, though. Well. <laughs> Sarah, don't laugh. <laughs> it's crazy to think, though, somebody like, I don't know how much basketball, like history, you know, but somebody like as short as Muggsy Bogues was an amazing No, I don't know dunker. this stuff. No. Really? No, no, no. Okay. No, I actually, you know, the terrible thing, Nate, is I become addicted to American football. I oh. I stopped being addicted to hockey, and now all I care about, right, when we're talking at the end of January in this podcast, all I care about is that the New England Patriots win the Super Bowl. I mean, next weekend, they just have to win. Tom Brady is like the king of all people, and anybody who says that that 41-year-old man isn't the best player, and anybody who says he has to retire should be just shot out of a cannon so get my cannon ready i guess oh uh, no <laughs> uh, you're kidding you don't listen, want the patriots to win i don't hate tom brady and actually i'm a fan of the patriots the, the beautiful swan song story of them winning the super bowl after like 9 11 in 2001 going into 2002 like yes his comebacks absolutely it, it, fourth quarter the they were down 41 to 3 against the jets and ended up winning that game like that that's a whole other podcast we could probably have but it's interesting that you fell in love with the Patriots. Oh, no. Out of Chicago? Really? No. The... I mean, I guess it depends on when, when you move here. No, to I your... just think Tom Brady is such a hardworking guy. He has such a work ethic. He's such a fine leader. He sets an example for everybody else on that team. All the pundits say he's 41 and he has to cash it in. Well, why are they in the Super Bowl, you morons, if he's such an old guy? Hello? At 41. You know, I think I, I, you know, I listen to how he leads his team and how much preparation he does. And I think it's that work ethic that I like as a conductor. You get inspired by him. Yeah. No, no. I, I work is everything. If you prepare, you have a chance. 
You can be talented, good looking, have the best perfume. You don't do the hard work. You're screwed. I like so that. I, I, he puts in a lot of work, and he knows the game. You see him go to the line, and he knows, oh, you crazy defensive back. Why are you over there? I'm going to pick you apart right now because he's so prepared. He is. He really, I mean, he knows the game And it's a lot like conducting. Anybody. If you don't walk in and know the thing cold, how can you help the people or, you know, to make better music if you don't know it cold? So, yeah, I like the Patriots. Okay. I'll, okay. Yeah. That's great. Uh, <laughs> so uh, to go back into your journey, we got to kind of like jump forward and jump back and jump forward again. There's a gap between you leaving Canada to now. We yeah. kind of need to fill in a little bit. What made you decide to move to America or, or what were like kind of like paths of opportunities led you here or? Uh, mm, that's a really long, hard question. I don't know if I can make it short. A lot of it has to do with God and I am a very blessed person. God keeps hitting me with lightning bolts. Like, uh, I'll, I won't get anything for a long time, and all of a sudden, bang, something happens, and I go, what, what did you just do to me? You know, and thank you very much. So let me see if I can do it quickly. Um, I won in the festival when I was 17. I finished high school early, and when you win in a little town, you get to go to the big city, like uh, Pincher Creek or Fort McLeod or Red Deer or Lethbridge, which has 20,000 people, and you get to compete against the big city kids. So if you can understand the Crows Nest Pass, Nate, my mother puts me on the Greyhound bus. She pins some money inside my jacket. Uh, the bus driver knows to let me off in Lethbridge. He walks me to the hotel. The hotel guy knows I'm going to be staying there. I hand him the envelope. Every morning, I have a cheeseburger, french fries, and a chocolate shake for breakfast. In the afternoon, I have a cheeseburger, french fries, and a chocolate shake for lunch. All the things my mother will never let me eat. And you know what? I'm not in school, and I'm staying in a hotel. You know? In a city, they have an escalator in Hudson's Bay. And I just ride that escalator all day long. Like an escalator. Wow. So, I'm in this hotel, and I'm 17. And the adjudicator from last year was there. And he lives in St. Louis, Missouri. And the really hardworking kids and the talented kids from Alberta had gone to have lessons with him at Christmas time or in the summer. And I thought, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this guy. So I wait in the lobby of the hotel and I wait and I wait. I think I waited for about six hours. And I thought, I'm just going to get in the elevator when he gets in the elevator and I'm going to go oh, fancy meeting you here. <laughs> like, how do you get a role in Hollywood, right? So I waited for him, and as I got in the elevator at about 2 in the morning and was going to push the button for one of the three floors in the hotel, he came down the steps, and I'm telling you, I wouldn't be here today if I pushed the button five seconds earlier. Wow. He got in the elevator, and I go, oh, Mr. Zabrak. How nice to run into you. And by the time we got to the third floor, I had asked him, do you think I could hum, come and have lessons with you? And he said, talk to me. And so I talked to him. He goes, what are you going to do? I said, my mom's not going to let me go to college next year because she knows uh, bad stuff is going to happen if I go to college. And he goes, okay, um, what's your mother's phone number? And he called my mother. My mother got up at 4 o'clock in the morning in a bad snowy day, drove to Lethbridge, had coffee with Mr. Zabrak, and they walked into the lobby and told me, you're going to St. Louis next year. Wow. And I went from practicing about maybe 20 minutes a day in grade 12, maybe 30 if my mother really yelled at me, to practicing eight hours every day. No matter what. In one year. You were just driven on a different level because you oh, now had a goal. Oh, yeah. Not only that, he would have just crushed me and sent me home. It was like, look, and then all the people around me in St. Louis, it was like, how can that kid play that? How can that kid play that? Because I always thought I was like the hottest. Then you go away somewhere real, like not the Crows in his past, and you go, oh, my gosh. You know, when I go into Juilliard, there was this little boy there who had lessons before me. He was 12, and I was 18, and he could play like a Beethoven sonata every week from memory. His name's Ken Noda. He's now an administrator at the Met phenomenally gifted wow. kid. I go in the bathroom with him. I want to punch him out. I'm like, you little monster. You can learn a Beethoven sonata in one week. I want to like take your little comb and like 
put it through your ear, you know. Oh. You know, but you learn, you, you know, I mean, he's a very nice fellow, you know, an enormously gifted guy. But you just learn, like, hey, you know what? You're not the hottest anymore. You better start working, dude. So you had to just rise to the level of the cream of the crop. You make your way, 18 years old, on a plane trip to America for the first time. You're here in a new land and a new experience, and I'm guessing it shapes you even further in your journey. And you picked up things, again, that tribe building the person. You pick up a little bit of the oh, yeah. American things to, to kind of take home after this first trip, maybe? Uh... I would say, I, I say this to people if they like someone like Ben, if you ask me, I learned everything I know about music from my piano teachers. I mean, when you play Bach and Mozart and Haydn and Chopin and Scriabin and Rachmaninoff and stuff, I learned everything that I use musically in my head now from my wonderful, amazing piano teachers. I learned how to conduct from my conducting teachers, but I can't, and they're very, it's very important to know how to conduct. But I can't say I ever learned anything about music, per se. So it was my piano teachers. And then the next year, I went to Juilliard in New York. And, of course, I was freaked out when I went to New York. I mean, just, I, I, uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know anything. I was, like, in New York City from the Crow's Nest Pass. I mean, fish out of water. Oh, fish out of water. Like, my uncle, who lived in, um, where's the place where they did a big rock show, the famous rock show in the 70s? Woodstock? He lived in Woodstock, so I got to Woodstock. My uncle drives me down into New York City on a, an August Sunday afternoon in late August. I'm in my corduroy pants, my nice long sleeve wool shirt, you know, with 500 bucks in my pocket that my mother put in there. And he dropped me off on the steps of Lincoln Center. And he said these words, go get them. I had no place to stay. I did not know a person. And I'm sitting with my two suitcases and my 500 bucks on the steps of Lincoln Center in the biggest, scariest city in the world. I never met a gay person. I'd never met a black person. I had met only one Jewish person before. And I'm like, what is going on here? And of course, Juilliard is just like full of talent. So I went down to, they said, oh, there's a nice man down there. He's an African-American man. I've never met an African-American man before, but I'm just going to go. He's driving a cab. Do you know a nice place to stay that's not too cheap? And he goes, go to the YMCA. You know, um, it's three blocks from here on 65th and uh, Central Park West. I knew what YMCA is, right? I know what YMCA is. Yeah. It's Young Men's Christian Association. They have one in Lethbridge. You can learn basket weaving and play basketball there, right? So when you say I learned things in America, yes, I learned that there are guns here. I learned that there's racism here. I learned that there's different things and then that crows in his pass. And, of course, there's lots of wonderful things. I mean, I got my education in America. I got my education in America, and I lived in two great cities, Philly and New York, and what you can learn in those two cities about music. I mean, those are some historical places for music and, and, and the evolution of music in this country. Yeah. Uh, what schools did you go to in America? I went to Juilliard for a year, and then I transferred to Temple because my teacher um, got a chance to be a visiting professor at Temple and take five students with a full scholarship to Temple. Oh, and you were like, lightning again, here we go. Mm, full scholarship, yes, temple. And, of course, the only temple I knew was Mormon temple because we lived near Cardston in Alberta. And I thought, this is going to be great, a nice Mormon school in this place called the City of Brotherly Love. I know this is going to be a lovely little, like, school, and I'm going to get free tuition. And, of course, I end up in North Philly in a school with 40,000 people, you know, that's not got anything to do with Mormon people. You know, it's like, you know, it's got to do with football and dorms and beer and architecture and which was great, you know, because I got a real, I was with a melange of people and I, I really loved being in a real dorm with normal people and, you know, getting, you know, having English classes and sociology classes and, you know, not just harmony all day long. Yeah, you actually like learned the deeper parts of us, this this side of the, mm -hmm. the, the country. Yeah. Uh, 
What has that been like for you? And, and I want you to talk further on this because you obviously stayed. Mm-hmm. You do live, you do have a residence in Canada still. I do now. Are you a dual resident of both countries? I am. I'm an American citizen now. That's amazing. Congratulations. How long have you been an official American citizen? Mm, about mm, four years, and you think? Five years? Yeah, it took, takes a long time, though. I have to tell you, it's not easy to become an American citizen. If no, you would I like. Mean, I, I was mean, on, when I was in Philly and I finished grad school, the IRS, no, not IRS, what do they call it? In, what were the guys, the immigration guys? Yeah, they I, just came and knocked on my door, and two guys in a nice white shirt and tie and just said, hello, your visa's up in six weeks, and you've done so many independent studies here, and you have to leave within six weeks, and we'll be checking. Okay, and I got on the airplane, and I had to go home to Canada. Bye-bye. Whoa. Bye-bye. Yeah. But, oh, okay, so I get off the airplane in Alberta. My father actually does not recognize me. <laughs> uh I walk up to him and I go, hello, dad. And he looks at me like, and I hear him telling a story to his wife. I saw this guy coming down the escalator and I thought, what a disgusting pile of rabble. And it ended up, it was Kirk coming up to me in this coat with these weird things, his hair all over and this long beard. And so I went home to Alberta. I lived in my father's basement. And the next day I went downtown to the CN Tower. And the director of culture was a man that I knew and um from summer camps and i walked in i knocked and i made an appointment and i said could you help me please i'm trying to be a conductor here i've got to live in edmonton for at least a year can you help me and he goes he picked up the phone and he called some guy in a place called grand prairie which is about six hours north of edmonton he goes are you still having auditions for conductors tomorrow <laughs> what? this is what i mean <laughs> tomorrow and i went that morning after i got off the plane Okay, so he said, yes. He said, what are the pieces? He goes, Blue Danube, blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. He goes, picks up the phone. He goes, "Um, you know, University of Alberta, can you have a courier bring over the Blue Danube score and the blah, 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 blah. I learned it that night, and I took the six-hour bus ride. I went to Grand Prairie. They have a very small orchestra. It's a northern lumber oil town, sort of. They have, like, they had one cello, one viola, three saxophones, no, you know, double bass, five flutes in the orchestra. I won the job. Now I'm the music director in one day of the Grand Prairie Symphony. A couple of weeks later, I go over to the university and I say to the gentleman, I said, I'm trying to be a conductor. Could I come here? Oh, I'll make you my assistant. I'll give you a library card, a parking pass, blah, 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 a little stipend. You can do rehearsals when I'm not around. But two weeks later, they call me from the Edmonton Philharmonic and say, we're the amateur orchestra in town. Our conductor is undergoing cancer treatments. We hear you in town. Would you like to conduct our orchestra? So in about six weeks, I had three jobs every week. And how can I describe something like that? That's got nothing to do with me. Just fate and ha- and timing and destiny and being yeah. no it's it's you know you get smiled on and then you have hard times and you get smiled on and you have hard times but it's just like I don't know what to call it I call it lightning like God goes okay send Kirk down to the CN Tower to have auditions tomorrow he'll win the audition you know it, don't know how to describe that it's just like consistently being reaffirmed that you're on the right path you were meant to be here doing this job you're meant to be affecting people I mean. Uh, mm, so nice way of putting it, and not and not just you know from what I know from Sarah talking about you so fondly, but I feel like everybody has such a genuine respect for you because you don't make it. You're not the maestro from Seinfeld, you know. You're okay. not the jerk to everybody who is is uh, cocky and overbearing and tries to make it oh, about no, you. I'm overbearing <clears throat> and I'm a pain in the ass and I'm like you know very intense and. Intense is okay. Yeah. I mean, I really believe in beauty and detail and everybody being prepared and everybody being completely involved. And I'm very intense about it. And I know it's uh, probably one of my failings. But, you know, it doesn't matter who you study. Whether you study Jerry Lewis making a film. Jerry Lewis is the guy who invents that camera where you can do the playbacks. He's the guy that does how many takes. He's the guy that has the heart attack running to the top of the stairs in that one take. He's the guy who builds the set himself for the first time on that set. He's the guy. And you think, oh, it's just Jerry Lewis. It's a bunch of ha-ha-ha. It's not. No, it's the You look at Clint Eastwood and you go, okay, Clint Eastwood's directing a film. Why is it so easy? 
because he has done so much work with his lighting designer, with his cameraman. They have set up every single angle, every city, you know, every single. So he knows when he's shooting that shot that the shot's going to work because he's got five cameras with the perfect lighting, with the perfect thing. And then he just goes, roll, you know, whatever, and it seems easy. But it, again, I'll say it's preparation. It's, you have to do, you have to do that, that work. You know, I mean, I think of it as an actor, too. Pick an actor that you admire, whether it's Tom Hanks or Meryl Streep or whomever you admire from the past. How many hours did Meryl Streep spend learning French Lieutenant's Woman? How many hours did she spend creating that character in Deer Hunter? She wasn't going to the playground playing volleyball with a bunch of people. She wasn't going to Safeway to buy kumquats. She was sitting in a room deciding upon her look, upon her accent, about the way she was going to move, about everything about her. And she had to sacrifice a lot in her life for that. And her husband, who's an amazing guy, and her children, I'm sure, had to sacrifice a tremendous amount. You can't just walk out onto the set, even as gifted as she is, and do that. So it's always preparation. Love that. And sacrifice. You have to sacrifice like anything in our lives. So are we almost at a spot where we probably need to be stopped? I know. When Anne stands up, that's danger. Okay. Okay. I'm just checking. Okay. okay. So we'll, we'll tie this in because I feel like we're sure. close. Edmonton Orchestra, you're conducting. When does the jump back to America happen? There, there's, the, there's that little gap we still need to fill. How did you get back to this part of here? Are you sure you want to know, Nate? Yes, of course. That's why I had you on my show. I want to know the journey. I need okay, to know the so journey. So I'm in the University of Alberta one day on my way to rehearsal, and I walk by a bulletin board. And I walk by it. And then I take three steps back, and I go, what did that say on the bulletin board? I hardly ever walked down that hall, by the way. And it says there's a competition in Canada for one person to go to Vienna to study, and they'll pay for you to go. And I go... Hmm, Vienna. That's where Mozart used to hang out. I wonder if I could apply for that. So I apply, and they say, you can't apply. You're a conductor. And I go, it says musician. So they had to put a little chamber orchestra together, and I competed against everybody, and I won. Now I'm on the airplane going to Vienna. I don't speak a word of German. I don't even know Guten Tag. I don't know anything. And all of a sudden, here I am in the middle of Vienna, three blocks away from the opera house. Mozart, Johann Strauss, Richard Strauss, Brahms, you name Beethoven, all around me. And I studied conducting there for two years at the conservatory. And I really learned to conduct there. And I went to the opera three nights a week for a dollar. It's all, you know, we got special Steplatz places. So I'm there. And one of my teachers was one of Von Karian's assistants. And he had an, uh, two opera houses in Germany that he was the music director of. And after my, my, about my middle of my second year, he said, Herr Musprat, um, you're ready to go. So I'm going to offer you a job in München Gladbach and Krefeld as the number six Chora Petiter. You're the bottom conductor. You play piano all day. You play do the ballets. You do Hello, Dolly, the 30th time in German, Guten Tag, Dolly, you know, but you get conducting experience and you're working in a German opera house, which is the way all the old conductors, whether it's Schulte or, you know, all of them learned this way in the old days. So now I'm in München Gladbach, Germany. I still hardly speak German and I'm playing piano for like these insane ballerinas all day and I'm conducting Guten Tag, Dolly and you know, after a while, they let you have a Mozart opera, an easier Mozart opera, about the 30th time they've done it. So everybody knows it inside out. But you're in the pit conducting in Germany. Then I go to Aspen, and I'm one of the fellows at Aspen. And the conducting teacher comes to me after I've been there for a couple of days, and he goes, Kirk, you have more conducting experience than anybody. This gentleman who's supposed to conduct a big student concert tomorrow, he can't do it. He is a Vietnam vet, and he's having flashbacks oh. because there are so many Asian players in the orchestra. The, the students are in the orchestra, like the really great yeah. hot students totally. from Juilliard and stuff. And he goes, he's having flashbacks. He just had a meltdown. Can you conduct a concert tomorrow? And, of course, what do I say? Duh. Yes. <laughs> so I stayed up all night. I learned the music. 
kind of. I conducted the concert, and after the concert, which I should not have been conducting, a lady came up to me after the concert, and she poked me in the chest and went, where do you work? And I, thought, I told her, you'd be polite to everybody, of course. And do you know, so I said, I work in München Gladbach. Do you know Walter Plante? I go, yeah, he's one of the tenors. Do you know Herr Schmidt? I go, yeah, he's the chorus director. And I go, oh, this lady's an agent or something. You know, she's a, an agent. And she goes, and da 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 And I thought, okay, that's nice. It was Leonard Slatkin's mother. And she was there with four or five people from the L.A. Phil that afternoon. She called Leonard Slatkin and said, Leonard, you're looking for an assistant conductor. I just saw this kid at Aspen. He's really good. I go back to Munch and Gladbach. I don't know anything about this. And the phone rings at 2 in the morning. Hello, I'm Joan Bracetti, the general manager of the St. Louis Symphony. I play a lot of jokes on people, and I think, sure. You know, I mean, I didn't say sure, but it's 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm going, yes, hello, and I think she has the wrong number or something. And she goes, uh, could you come and audition here in two months for the assistant conductor job? I'm like, huh? You know, get on the airplane. I won't tell you the whole story. You know, 16 people, I'm the last one. I win the audition. I'm sitting in St. Louis in Powell Hall going, huh, again. Ha, huh. I shouldn't have been conducting that concert that day. That lady should not have been there. Leonard Slatkin should not have been looking for an assistant conductor right then. I shouldn't have won that audition. I'd never talked to an audience. I didn't know what a kitty concert was. I didn't know what a pops concert was. I know what Guten Tag Dolly in the pit was in Germany. That's all I knew, and I knew how to play the piano. So ugh, now I'm in St. Louis. Full circle. Back to St. Louis, back to the start. So that's got to be almost overwhelming for you. I know, and the first time I ever heard, a pro- I mean, a real professional orchestra was at the St. Louis Symphony when I was 17, and Leonard Slatkin was conducting that night, and he was the assistant conductor. No way. And later I told him, I said, do you remember like that concert you did with Rudolf Furkoshny? I said, I was at it, and it was the first time I'd really, I mean, the Calgary Phil would come to our gym and play, but I'd never like been in a real concert hall before or heard orchestral music. And it was just, it's insane. I mean, it's just nuts, the like coincidences. And then the flash forward, you get the job in St. Louis, and then now you're put in a situation where I'm guessing more people find out about you, more people are hearing about you through exposure and all the other things that have come in your career. Mm-hmm. Your name is growing. Did yeah. you leave St. Louis and come to do this next or was there another journey in your journey too too simple nate too simple nate oh no no so mr slatkin has a rule you if you survive three years at the st louis symphony okay great if you don't survive one year you're gone but after three years he kicks you out no matter what it's a bear cub yeah he needs another guy to have the experience and it's time for you to move on and grow real boy pants you know so uh, Mr. Silverstein, who used to be the concert master of the Boston Symphony, was the music director in Utah. And he came through and guest conducted at St. Louis several times. And he saw me conduct. He happened to be looking for an associate conductor, which is the next rung up. And so I went and auditioned at the Utah Symphony. And again, I won the job. So now I'm in Salt Lake City. And I have much more conducting because there's Deer Valley and there's Snowbird and they give me more conducting because now I'm an associate conductor, right? It's a very good orchestra, fantastic place to live. I mean, just beautiful concert hall. And then I'm in Utah in my second year and the phone rings in my office one day and uh, the voice says, hello, this is Robert Moyer, the artistic administrator at the Pittsburgh Symphony. Can you come here on either Tuesday or Wednesday next week and conduct for Lauren Mazel? I'm like, uh, and I, I said, I think so. I went to Mr. Silverstein. He said, go, we'll figure out what to do with you. It was a piece I'd never conducted before. It was like this, the miraculous Mandarin, which is one of the hardest pieces in the world. I went to the library. I got a score. I tried to learn it. I didn't sleep for three days. I flew to Pittsburgh, and uh, I auditioned, and they gave me the job. And again, the reason I got the job was that they had just fired their resident conductor, and they had one week left in the season, and then Mazel was gone for four, four months. And the artistic administrator said, who could we look for to come and do an audition? And David Zinman, who is the conductor of the Baltimore Symphony, was standing in the office. And he said, what about Muspratt? 
he did a good job. If he hadn't said my name, I wouldn't have the audition. If he hadn't been standing there, he would have never picked up the phone and called me. So I wonder, and now I'm in the, at the Pittsburgh Symphony with one of the most famous conductors in the world. And uh, I don't remember the five years, actually, of my life. It's just a blur because I just worked from 9 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. Nonstop. It's a great, fantastic experience. I mean, but I don't remember any of it. I just remember walking to the hall and walking back to the hall. You know, I live two blocks away. And then somebody called me in Pittsburgh one day when I was finished my job there and said, do you want to come to Northwest Indiana audition for the Northwest Indiana Symphony? And I thought, I wonder where Indiana is. <laughs> I knew it's over there by Ohio somewhere, but my, in my American geography is still, you know, if you say South Carolina next to, you know, Louisiana or something, I go, mm, yeah, maybe, you know. It's, but if you ask me about Saskatchewan, I'm really good with Saskatchewan or Manitoba. So, you know, it's just, I don't know how to describe that kind of luck. You know, I just don't. So it's, you know, phenomenal. So I'm guessing you leave Pittsburgh to do the audition here. Mm -hmm. And you just blew the doors away, obviously. No, actually, I got here. And they told me there's no way you can win this job because uh, ha they had a two-year search. And I was in the second year of the search. And during the first year, they'd already picked somebody. What? And they said, we'll just pay you your fee. You don't have to come. And I go, no way. You paid me to conduct a concert. I'm coming to conduct a concert. Right? You paid me. They gave me the money. I'm coming to conduct. I'm a conductor. So I came and conducted. And the next year, they fired that guy. And the orchestra liked me. So, again, just weird, just wacko. Who knows what's going to happen this afternoon on my way home? You know, you know, I'll win the lottery or something. Who knows? So then picking up the Mac, since you mm -hmm. are in the area, they're looking, I'm guessing, for somebody, and mm -hmm. you just go, I can do them both. Mm -mm. Michelle, our concertmaster, came to me and said, you know, I play concertmaster at this other orchestra. And I'm like where's Glenn Allen? You know, I'm, I'm just barely figured out Indiana at that point. And so I came up and they had five candidates and lots of interviews and, you know, all sorts of stuff. And I was lucky again to win the audition. But if Michelle hadn't said, you know, I think you'd be good for this job. Why don't you look into it? And I've recommended you. Uh, again, I wouldn't have it. And I, I love working, you know, in both places. They're very, very different places, different demographies, different uh, feelings, different communities, different programming. You know, we, we do New Year's Eve here, and it sells three concerts out. New Year's Eve wouldn't work over in Northwest Indiana. It's just a different place. It doesn't, it's not right there. We do Holiday Pops concerts in Northwest Indiana. People, it's part of the community. A Holiday Pops concert here, eh. So it's a very different experience. So that's got to be great, being able to kind of have two different outlets and different mm -hmm. ways to utilize what you know. Yeah. I feel like ultimately, as we wrap this up, your journey could be almost defined as timing with preparation. You were prepared for anything, so no matter what the timing was, you could jump in and take over, and that's how you've gotten where you are. Lots of luck. Lots of luck. Yeah, if you work hard. But, you know, we all know that. It doesn't matter. If you want to, you know, win a tennis championship, what do you have to eat every day? How do you have to sleep? What do you have to give up with your family? How do you have to travel? You know, what, what clothes are you wearing? What racket are you wearing? Then you have a chance to win the Open. So, you know, that preparation plus luck is always, yeah, it's it, it's it. And, you know, I have to say, Nate, going all the way around the circle, is that I learned that work ethic in the Crozeness Pass. Not me. I was a lazy bastard. Okay. Okay. You know, I skipped a grade and I was a cool guy and I was smart. Why work? This is all boring old people crap. Why do I have to learn what a gerund or a synonym or, you know, a chemistry? This is all for old people or dumb people. But I saw the coal miners every day going by my house and I saw my father coming off the coal mine, my grandfather coming off the coal mine. My brothers even worked in the coal mine in the summer. So you go work in the cold, an eight hour shift underground. You know, somebody tells me, oh, Kirk, you work so hard. I always tell them, are you kidding? Just go work in a coal mine for eight hours. You know, what I do is pee-pee. I study viola parts. Oh, it's tiring. Sure, it's tiring, but it's not like people of the generations before us worked. Imagine Correct. being a settler in America, being a farmer in Oklahoma, being in the Dust Bowl, 
being a first oil rigger in Texas, being a Louisiana shrimp farmer, you know, in the old days. Those people worked. We don't work anymore. Yeah, those were pioneers of, of everything, essentially. No, we ordered food on Peapod or something. You know I mean? You know, <laughs> DoorDash or Grubhub? <laughs> yes. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, interesting to note, one last thing. I, I do have one final question in the, in the Crow's Nest Pass thing that I think it would be remiss without asking. You said that your brothers and father and grandfather and everybody worked in the coal mines. Does that fill your youth with some sort of almost never-ending anxiety because of the history of Crow's Nest Pass? Knowing, or it, it, was, it was not Crow's Nest Pass, it was Frank that had, oh, the, had, the, had the situation? Frank was completely covered, like, well, I think. Three people survived it out of the whole town. Whoa. Hillcrest, one quarter of the town was killed in one day. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I understand your – that's the only question I haven't understood so far. Anxiety? I guess I'm just saying growing up knowing that at any point your family could just get boom or your town could just get wiped off the map with nothing because it's almost – well – the history you grew up with, knowing these stories of where around you grew up. So did that fill you with like a, I don't want my brothers to die in a coal mm. mine or something? Wow, what an interesting question. <clears throat> I never thought. No, I think I was too naive and too just, I, I, I think, I always say I'm like Heidi. You know, the book Heidi, I'm just growing up in the mountains and I have my little sheep and everything's fine. And I didn't know anything about the world. We didn't have TV. We didn't have anything. You know, I mean, our library was the size of that piano over there. You know, oh, I didn't know anything about the outside world. So I was very naive. Um, the question is fascinating on several levels, and I don't think I can give you a succinct answer to it. That's okay. Um, I wish I could, but I, I don't think I can. That's all Not, right. There's no anxiety whatsoever. Uh, no, no anxiety at all. Just admiration for people who did that kind of work and, and recognizing. Uh, I can tell you a sort of uh, something in my head that I add up. My mom was the only person in her high school graduating class from the Crow's Nest Pass that went on to higher learning. Okay. I graduated in the largest graduating class in the history of the Crow's Nest Pass. hundred of us. Ninety of us went to university. That's just the difference in that curve of time. So from 1% to yes. 90% essentially. Yes, exactly. So you live in, a, again, your luck. If you're born in the hungry 30s, you live in a certain way. If you're a young guy and you're 20 years old in 1942, you die on the beach in Iwo Jima. If you happen to be American in 1968, you may die in Phnom Penh. You know? yeah, if absolutely. you're a Canadian born in a little village and it happens to be that time when everybody does have a job, and you, you know, then your parents can go, oh, you're not right off the boat. You're a kid who's smart at chemistry. You're going to the University of Alberta. Oh, you're, you're a good little pianist kid or something you're going to go study piano oh you're going to in my graduating class of 100 people yeah 10 10 are musicians wow that's in a, a place super that had small no music in the school nothing no mu no music program growing up man that's... too small a school but 10 of us just because of the environment and when you ask me about kids and environment if you give i use the garden you know metaphor all the time you give the kids of the garden you give them taekwondo or you give them spelling or you give them you know a nice music place or a theater place or a great chemistry lab or a robotics thing or something there's a garden for them they will get it. if you don't give them that there's no way a kid isn't just going to pick up the saxophone and you know or be good at robotics you have to have that teacher that environment and you know, sadly, we don't, again, Anne is going to be upset with me, but if I could stop conducting orchestras, and I'd say, okay, I'll make you a deal, God. Uh, I'll stop conducting, and I'll lose all my hair, but you will have music programs in all the high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools in Illinois and Indiana. I would make that deal in a second. Because it's bigger than you. 
you're changing other people's lives. Yeah, and but that, just imagine that, how yeah, beautiful that would absolutely. be. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you have a son who's going into elementary school. We're sitting here with Veronica. And if he could have a little bit of music every single year, whether he's a singer or whether he's an actor or whether he's a set designer, he's a script writer or he's a piano player or, you know, whatever, you know, or he's a chemist. If he just has that there, great. But music seems to be, oh, yeah, whatever. And uh, that, of course, really upsets me but you are the change and i think that more little. people well hey Thanks. a little change is better than no change Kurt. yeah absolutely so i want to say thank you so much for doing Thanks, the voice Nate. of survival with me hopefully we didn't go too far past your time i know you've no. got a lot of stuff going you also are planning to travel home to crow's nest pass here I in am. a couple days so glad to get you in before you take off for a while now thank you so, very much for doing this with us yeah, thank you for letting me have this conversation thanks right. to you guys for listening in uh, as always folks you can check out the voice survival podcast right here at the journey into comics network at journey into comics.com get us on itunes podbean stitcher radio google play music or spotify just search journey into comics network Smash the subscribe button, you'll get every show that comes out every single day of the week. Or go to patreon.com backslash journey into comics where you can give us a dollar for early access and exclusive content. Thanks to all the listeners on uh, journeyintocomics.com. We'll hit you guys with the links and everything in the description below. See you later on The Voice of Survival Podcast.